because they said it was desirable and not required. They also needed a large amount of power, approximately 12 to 15,000 kilowatts. Now, a lot of you have made the trip up to the fairgrounds road and went out through TNT and looked at the igloos and things. Today, I ask you if you make that trip again up there to take a look at the traffic circle before you turn on to fairground road. That traffic circle was developed for the use of getting heavy trucks and things like that through um, as to not damage the roads. All these requirements were met and then some. After cutting through the red tape, jurisdiction over the defense plant's construction was transformed uh, for, or transferred from the Army Construction Quartermaster's Corps to the Army Engineers. This was set forth in a bill signed by President Roosevelt in 1941. Now, Captain Pierre V. Kiefer, who was executive officer of the Huntington District Corps to the Army Engineers, was now in charge of the construction. According to the Office of the Zone Construction Quartermaster, on November 29, 1941, the War Department announced that this would indeed be the site that they wanted to build on at the immediate release of the Point Pleasant Register Stadium. The War Department today announced tentative selection of a site for TNT manufacturing plant in the vicinity of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. The plant will be known as the West Virginia Ordnance Works and will be constructed and operated by private concerns under control and supervision of the U.S. Army. By December 2nd, the 5th Zone Construction Quartermaster, Lieutenant Colonel B.F. Vandervoot, instructed the Zone Real Estate Director, a Mr. M.J. O'Bairn, to establish an office in the town of Point Pleasant and acquire the 8,000 acre site. The letter follows. Initial phase of the land acquisition work will be handled by Mr. O'Bairn and Mr. William Stowe. They will make a gross appraisal of the site to determine the amount of cash which will be required to buy the land. Shortly after, Mr. O'Bairn and Mr. Stowe began on the land acquisition of Point Pleasant, and they appointed attorney James, J James F. Miller of Columbus to serve as the field project manager. Miller was required to supervise the planning of the land acquisition, and the next day on December 3rd, the people of Point Pleasant were already seeing signs that the ordinance industry had selected land here as their new home. It was then decided that the purchasing of 8,000 acres of land in the Robinson District, five miles northeast of Point Pleasant in Mason County, would soon begin. The newspaper article goes on to say that the purchasing of land would continue over the next four months and the construction of the plant would begin immediately after. Production finally began in March of 1942 and was fully completed by 1943. The TNT plant itself spanned over 8,000 acres and consisted of numerous facilities that all played an intricate role in producing, storing, and shipping the TNT raw material. In the beginning, the plant employed over 8,000 workers, and in its prime, the ordnance plant employed over 3,000. 3,000 workers throughout the main production years of 1942 to 1945. <clears throat> The TNT plant operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years, and it produced approximately 720,000 pounds of this raw material daily, which was constantly being shipped out to surrounding facilities by truck and railway. With so many people commuting to Point Pleasant, the Huntington District Corps required that the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad establish a railway for defense workers to be transported from Huntington, West Virginia to Point Pleasant. This in turn made Point Pleasant developers start to focus on things like houses, dormitories, roads, a hospital, a fire department, and so on. When the construction of the West Virginia Ordnance Works began, there was an influx of workers coming into Point Pleasant to help with the war effort. It is estimated that during this time in 1941, Point Pleasant's population was around three to 3,500 residents. And after the arrival of the construction workers from around the Ohio Valley, Point Pleasant's population more than doubled. This increase in population led to an urgent need for housing on and off the property of the West Virginia Ordnance Works. On site adjustments for incoming workers were set into motion with the building of the men and women's dormitories on site. These were two large, two and three story buildings that were supposed to take some of the pressure off of, or for residency off the town of Point Pleasant. There was also several staff houses built to accommodate supervisors around the entrance of the ordnance plan. Also, the building in downtown Point Pleasant on Vianne Street, known as the Oshel Motor Sales Building, was made into a men's dormitory as well. Even with these dormitories in place, there was still a need for residency for families relocating to the town. To take control of the situation, the town of Point Pleasant began changing the town to accommodate the workers. 
The Ocean Motor Sales Building was completely renovated to accommodate the housing need. It consisted of 30 rooms, some with private bath and showers, and the showroom for the building was transformed into a lobby, which included a counter where tobacco and other necessities were sold. Now, neighborhoods were beginning to be transformed with the construction of these quick build houses. The neighborhoods and streets most affected by these houses were Mount Vernon, Jefferson, and Lincoln Avenues, along with the neighborhoods of Burdett Edition and Park Drive. On February 17, 1942, the Point Pleasant Register discussed the day when the Cottage Builders Company came to the area and erected a display unit of their quick build houses in town. People were absolutely amazed to see that the process, process of, these, of the house building took two hours to complete. The article states, the Cottage Builders Company is prepared to erect an unlimited number of low cost emergency quarters here. The buildings are 10 by 10 feet frame structures accommodating four beds and chemical facilities. Now, if you take a look around the town when you're driving through at some point during your stay here, Take a look at Mount Vernon when you drive past it, and Jefferson, and Lincoln. A lot of the houses are very similar because when they brought in all these houses, they were brought in, people built them, they were also brought in by barge. Um, even though those houses are still there, they're changed a little bit, but you'll be able to see that there are remnants of, of the houses that were built. Now, these houses would soon be built all over Point Pleasant to accommodate living situations across the town. So with the housing problem under control, focus shifted to the construction of the TNT plant storage and ordnance facility itself. Before the, long, before the construction was completed enough to finally begin production and store the TNT. Now, if we take a look at the first slide that I have here, this is a, an overview of the West Virginia Ordnance Works. The big road running straight down the middle here, as you can see to the right, is Fairground Road. There was office administration buildings to the left and to the right along with two big large parking lots a place where the workers would get dressed and so on. And for anybody that's been, been to TNT area and down Fairground Road, this is quite different than what it looks like today. So at the head of the ordinance works, there was a rather large administration area. The area contained, as I said, two large parking lots. It consisted mainly of numerous office buildings where most of the paperwork to the plant was done. There was also a building within that area where the workers would leave most of their personal items and change into company approved clothing before going to work. A large part of the facility was the magazine area. This area consisted of numerous storage areas known as igloos, strategically placed in a grid pattern throughout the area as, to if, or as if uh, one of them were to explode, they all wouldn't explode. So they were placed in a grid pattern throughout the area. This was the area where the completed product would be stored. Uh, the igloos were dome structured encased in a concrete a foot thick and covered in soil. The only way of distinguish, distinguishing them from a regular hill was the huge steel door facing the roads that ran in front of them. Next you have Powerhouse A and Powerhouse B. The electrical system and substation was located away from the main facility and as I said before, capable of producing 12 to 15,000 kilowatts of power. Located not far away was an AEP switching station with an incoming line that ran directly to the substation to supply it with power. Now the acid that was used was made in one large acid, acid area. It was a two-sided area labeled side A and side B with the acid area directly in the middle. These facilities were accompanied by two large row of storage areas that were labeled A and B as before. These rows of tanks uh, went along either side of the acid area and these were numerous storage tanks elevated above the ground by concrete structures which were located on either side of the acid area. And I do believe some of those concrete structures are still standing today. The facility also had several large water reservoirs. The first two were reinforced concrete water reservoirs. Each had a capacity of 5 million gallons of water and measured 140 feet in diameter and 22 feet high. These were located away from the main part of the ordnance plants near the main classification yard. Next was the red water reservoirs, which consisted of three tanks that held 30 million gallons. The red water reservoirs were located beside the outgoing classification yards as well. There was also a large clay lined earth reservoir which was used as an emergency fire water supply <clears throat> that held 2.5 million gallons of water. This was located beside the administration area. And the last is the yellow water reservoir. It was located directly outside of the acid area and had a capacity of 5 million gallons. 
Now, we'll take a look at the extensive rail yard that went throughout the plant itself. Um, hundreds of miles of train tracks to get the product out where it needed to go. Next is a picture of the men's dormitory, which was built on site. Uh, two stories to take, like I said, take some of the pressure off of Point Pleasant's living situation. Next is the women's dormitory, also on site. Back it up one. Um, there for the women workers. Now, if you travel down Fairground Road and you take a, take a look to your left, as soon as you turn on to the road itself, you'll see a road called Staff House Road. And if you notice, the houses that are in this kind of C pattern are still there today. Now, slightly modified, but they're still there today. So if you take a trip out there and take a look to your left, you'll still see the, the houses standing there. This is where the staff and administration uh, stayed on site at the, at the Ordnance Works plant. Now, if you take a look at the, um, the middle road running down the middle here, that's Fairground Road, and Staff House Road splits off and kind of snakes up into that little circle down the bottom left. That's where all the staff and everybody would stay at. This, maybe, if I can get it to work. This is an experimental cooling cascade um, that the plant had in operation. As you can see, the chemicals are run down the stair steps into the, the tub, which doesn't have a lid on it, which would constantly spill over the sides. You can see from the residue and things like that, that it would, that it would actually spill over. Now, the EPA was not prevalent during this time. Uh, they weren't around. So what you see here is negligence on, on their part towards the, um, the pollution and uh, disposal of their chemicals. These are neutralization chambers, the yellow water neutralizing chamber. Uh, what would happen here is the water would flow from chamber to chamber, um, hopefully diluting some of the toxicities and things like that in the water, um, trying to neutralize some of the acids and different things like that. This was a wastewater diffuser, maybe, wastewater diffuser pipes. Now these pipes ran all throughout the plant itself. This one just happens to be the wastewater which was dumped directly into that body of water there, which we all know is the Ohio River. The chemicals were dumped directly into the river uh, during production and um, were not properly removed once the, um, once the plant stopped making the chemicals that they needed. <clears throat> so on August 15th, 1945, after three years of producing TNT, the West Virginia Ordnance Works abruptly ended their productions. With the war over, there was no more use for explosives being made and no more use for the people who worked at the plant. After production ceased, there were around 3,500 workers who were suddenly without jobs. All that was left to do was tear down the buildings and clean up the leftover chemicals. As suddenly as the plant was construction, constructed, it was deconstructed just as fast and out of state, empl and out of state employees returned to their place of origin instead of becoming permanent residents as originally intended. Point Pleasant had the idea that the people that came in to work at the plant would set roots here and stay here. That just was not the case. So on August 15th, 1945, the Point Pleasant Register released an article proclaiming that the production of TNT had stopped at the West Virginia Ordnance Works, which was then operated by General Chemical Defense Corps Major J.D. Frazier. Frazier went on the record to state that immediate stoppage is in accordance with the directive of the War Department, he said. Employees are to report for the regular shift Friday after the two-day holiday in order to take care of plant cleanup and the storage of raw materials. Workers were required to complete the closing down of the production plant and employees would leave the work, <coughs> excuse me, would leave as the work was completed. The first cleanup consisted, <coughs> consisted of tearing down most of the buildings and, disposable, and disposing of leftover chemicals. In 1945, most of the West Virginia Ordnance Works was declared surplus and large amount of buildings were poorly torn down and what could be salvaged was. By 1949, most of the plumbing and processing equipment had been removed. And after closing, most of the leftover chemicals were removed from the plant, but some still remained. What remained were contaminated sewage lines, which ran into the red and yellow water lines. These lines ran throughout the plant to different retention ponds, reservoirs, and actually into the Ohio River itself. Instead of removing these sewer lines, they were blocked off and left in the ground. Over, year, over the years, the contaminated pipes decayed and seeped different acids and lead deepened into the soil and water in this area. 
Much like other ordnance manufacturing areas around the U.S., the TNT area land had become terribly contaminated from years of chemical production and sloppy chemical waste. These, wa these chemicals leaked into the soil for 37 years, 1942 to 1979. The contamination problem became evident when the redwater seepage from the ground was observed near an old retention pond by a DNR officer. By the 1980s, the West Virginia Ordnance Works, or the TNT area, was one of the most polluted places in the United States. It was even placed in the top 10 of the Superfund Cleanup Project. This is a government project that is responsible for cleaning up old ordnance facilities around the U.S. and as well as other polluted areas or sites. With the help of the EPA, cleanup activities have been performed, a groundwater pump treatment system is in operation as we speak, and the area was placed in the long-term monitoring system. The cleanup project is still working on parts of these areas today. Today, the West Virginia Ordnance, Ordnance Works land is mostly recreational land consisting, consisting of different farms, woodlands, and ponds. A large portion of this land is known as the McClinic Wildlife Area and occupies over 2,700 acres. This land has approximately 40 ponds and people are allowed to fish in 35 of them. The remaining five are still too contaminated to fish in and are closed to the public. Large pieces of concrete scatter the landscape that still remain from huge buildings that used to cover the land. The igloos in the magazine area are now grown over and dilapidated. Some of the administration buildings are still standing, but are only used for storage and an office building used during our county fair once a year. So as, you, as you've seen today, the West Virginia Ordnance Works was one of the biggest wartime industries that Point Pleasant had ever seen. It actually reshaped the town demographically and physically. This single industry brought thousands of jobs to Point Pleasant, and the town of Point Pleasant was part of one of the biggest booms of the wartime economy, and at the same time was part of one of the biggest busts after the war's end. Not only was Point Pleasant victim to a post-war production economy, it also fell victim to some of the worst pollution anyone has ever seen in the United States, and the residents of Point Pleasant are still feeling the effects of this ordinance works plan today. So I'd like to open up the floor right now to anybody that may have some questions about anything that was said. About 10 to 15 minutes. I'll also be available after this to answer any questions that anybody might have. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? What? Yes, sorry. Yes, there's people that live in those houses now. Um, they're not, they're just owned by the people that live in those houses. The people right but you can still see in the pattern that they're sitting in that those were actually the original houses that were there that the staff lived in yes well it, it um i would say around um a couple hundred i would say because they were scattered throughout the area like i said in the grid pattern so if one would blow up they all would blow up uh, some are blocked off that you can actually walk over the gate and walk back to. Some are located on Potter's Creek Road, um, out through TNT, and just various places. Yes? I can't say um, because I, I, I can't say if, if that actually happened or not through any accidents. Um, but in my research, I haven't, I haven't found any yet. But as my research is always ongoing, so there's the possibility that there may have been. Anybody else? Yep. Most of the time it was mostly rail. Um, the things that were brought in mostly on the river were the cottage cottages that were brought in and put up for people that actually uh, were coming to this area to live. Um, the, the B and O, as I said, came through and carried workers through, um, but most of the chemicals and things like that. Actually, a lot of people think that the TNT area produced sticks of dynamite during these during this time, but in reality, they produced the the product that would that would explode the the toluene. It was a a yellow flake, kind of looked like a gold flake, and we produce you know millions of those a day here. Yes. Yes, most of the bunkers that people are allowed to go in are empty. Some are locked up, so that's to be determined. 
There was actually an explosion in one a few years ago, I believe it was in 2010, um, where unidentified substance inside of one exploded, which uh, kind of adds to the mystery of the, uh, the igloos out there. But the ones that people are actually allowed to go to, yes, they are empty. Yes? Yes. There's a possibility that could be. It would be ignorant of me to say no because I'm, I'm not very sure on that, on what's recently been stored out there. But it is a little, a little funny that they haven't monitored. And after that explosion that happened in 2010, there was a ton of signs that were put up everywhere out there that was warning of of toxic, like toxic chemicals and things like that in the area. So that would actually lead me to believe that something was probably there that wasn't supposed to be there or that the people weren't supposed to know about. Yes? Excuse me? Actually, the land was given to the state of West Virginia and I think around 2,700 acres of it were made into the uh, McClinic Wildlife Area. Um, it's where a lot of people from Point Pleasant will go and hunt and fish and things like that. Yeah? Well, considering now that the Ohio River is one of the most polluted rivers in the United States, I'd say it had a substantial, a substantial impact on it. Um, although it would be hard to find information on how it affected it during that time because of the EPA not being around. So my guess would be it wasn't too healthy for the fish and wildlife that, that used that river. But actually a few years ago, um, um, TNT had a, a soil treatment facility uh, located out there and uh, a water treatment facility as well as well so my guess would be that it wouldn't it would affect it pretty negatively any more questions yes well right now I can't verify whether it was or wasn't true but I do know that on some of the blueprints that I've looked at, uh, there is, it looks to be an underground maintenance facility that was that was located underneath the actual plant. This could be or could not be true because I have yet to verify it. But I do know in the 1970s that large amounts of clay were brought into the area and dumped out there to cover up certain things. And there's also large piles of rocks out there that cover up something. We're just not sure, I'm just not sure of what that actually is. It could be an entrance, an entrance into the underground maintenance facility, um, or it could be just the covering up of, of different pipes and things so they didn't continue leaking after they were, or, um, so they could be removed and things. Um, there's also rumors of uh, different tunnels and things that run from downtown Mason, or I'm sorry, downtown Main Street, all the way out to TNT area, to these different places, but that's yet to be verified as well. Hopefully, as I continue my research, I'll be able to elaborate a little bit more on that. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Lead line bunkers. For the most part, most of the bunkers were um, just a foot thick of concrete with soil put on top. Now there could have been lead in them as well, but I can't verify that. Right. Now, there was a large amount of, you know, there was a lot of toxins out there from these chemicals that were, um, that were stored out there. And I would say more, more pollution came from the making of them and the, uh, the sloppy ways that they were produced um, that would show that. But, yeah. So is there any other questions? Yes. How many bunkers are out there? How many bunkers are out there? Possibly around 200 that I've been able to see on the maps and things like that. It's around 100 to 200 bunkers, which are scattered throughout the area. Yes? In your historiographical research, have you been able to interview people that worked at the facility during this time period? I have not been able to interview anybody from the facility personally, um, mostly because the majority of the workers there ended up leaving the area and going back to where they were from. But I'm sure that if I, as I continue my research, which is always <laughs> ongoing, that I would be able to find somebody that, that did indeed work there. 
Now, in the 1970s, um, I do I do believe that they stored actual sticks of TNT out there. Uh, my father worked out there in the 70s. He would actually work in the igloos to store the TNT and things like that. After that, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Yes. As far as the negative health effects from working at the plant, there wasn't any research that indicated so, but the negative health effects that have, excuse me, the negative effects that have, have plagued this town uh, came from, from numerous places. The TNT area, the West Virginia Ornus Works plant started that off on top of the many power plants that we have up and down the river here. And um, so our soil and our water was very contaminated from these things because I believe the power plants were built in the 50s. Um, so that on top of the other is just kind of a, uh, a lot of bad things here in this area. Yes. Well, after the explosion in 2010, some parts were blocked off from people and warned people not to go into that area. Now there are, like I said, five different ponds out there that people are still not allowed to fish in because of the contamination in them. So as far as anything being blocked off or like fenced off or anything like that, I'm not aware of, but I do know that a lot of the roads that go back to the igloos are blocked off by a metal rail in front of them. You can you know, step over and walk back to it and, and inspect for yourself. But um, I'm pretty sure um, other than the ponds being closed off, there was, there was nothing else being blocked off, just signs warning that the area would be contaminated. Yes. I'm not at liberty to say because I may or may not have fished there and caught <laughs> and caught a few fish out of there. But uh, from what I hear, yes, there's some pretty big bass in there. <laughs> Anybody else? I've never seen anything about it, but then again, I can't verify that as well. As far as dummy runs and stuff, it would make sense, especially since it was such a, a large ordinance plant. Um, so yes, that would that would make sense, but I, I can't verify if it did or did not happen. But it would be very common for people to do things like that in areas like this. Yes. I believe the last, now don't quote me on this, but I believe the last sighting of the Mothman, um, which I, I could be entirely wrong, uh, would be whenever he was supposedly spotted um, at the Silver Bridge before it collapsed or after it collapsed. But as far as out TNT, um, near the facility itself, I'm not aware of any, but you know, that's, um, that's open for interpretation. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of people that have seen things out TNT that'd be able to back that up. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Do you know anything about the earlier history of that piece of property, like before the TNT thing? Yes. Uh, the majority of that property was um, mainly owned by farmers. Uh, it was agricultural land. Uh, that would be the main reason why the people of Jefferson County did not want to have that production facility there because they were afraid of losing their land. Now, after the plant was torn down, the farmers were actually given first dibs on getting their land back. From, from them as well, but after the facility was there for so long, the land probably wouldn't have been the best for, for agriculture afterwards. Now, as you drive through, on your way out to the TNT area, uh, Camp Conley Road, there was actually uh, a base there, and there was a firing range and barracks and everything else that the people would stay at, um, or the army would stay at there. Um, and that area has been subject to lead removal from the bullets that were fired, uh, the shell casings and things like that had to uh, be removed. Actually, it wasn't very long ago that they had to go in and do that. 
So. Any more questions? Oh, sorry. I can't really see. Yes. Excuse me? were hidden was so that people flying, if, if there were to be an enemy that flew over top of the United States, they couldn't see down and see that, you know, where we stored our explosives and things, because that would have been a main target for, for people to bomb or attack. And if they would have attacked that, you know, 720,000 pounds of this raw material out there would have created a, a pretty big boom. And I don't think we would be sitting in this theater today. So they hit them like that. And they also covered them in a layer of soil. So they would be they would be hidden from from planes or any kind of attack. Yes. Now, see, that would be hard to find or like to find because most of the workers have moved out. There are a few that still live here. And as far as the confidentiality <laughs> agreements that they had, I'm not aware of anything being lifted or, or anything like that. It's still pretty hard to find information on everything that actually happened there at that site. Um, the majority of my research came from uh, the Point Pleasant Register and other various documents that I was able to find. Um, uh, Jack Fowler of the River Museum down here was, was nice enough to, to lend me uh, different photos of, of newspaper clippings and things like that from the register during the time. Also official records from um, the U.S. Department of Defense and things like that were were there, so I could take a look at that as well. Yes, I could. I could check into that. Uh, hopefully, next year, if I get to come back and, and reread this this information, I'll expand it a little bit more on it. But as I've said, that this is an ongoing project. Hopefully, be turned into a book one of these days. But. Um, it's just a, a very tedious pro process to go through. So I am slowly but surely working my way through to, um, to find out if that is indeed released and things like that. Any other questions? Okay. Well, guys, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out to the 16th Annual Mothman Festival. Thank you all very much.